everyone. Um, I hope you had a lovely lunch. Uh, I particularly enjoyed that meat soup. Uh, what was that? It was delicious. So thank you very much to everyone who prepared it. Um, so this is panel 10, and I, I, I think this one will be, will be super, intri super interesting. Excuse me. Cybersecurity, democracy, and human rights. Could a more human-centric approach to cybersecurity Strengthen democracy. And to talk to us about that is our um, brilliant panel, uh, Maggie Recci, Alp Toker, Valentin Weber, and our moderator is Maya Bielosh. Thank you. Welcome once again. Um, I would like to start this panel by saying uh, that human rights are at risk with increasing digitalization, especially in the context that we are talking about today, that is uh, rising authoritarianism and in the times of crisis like pandemics and especially the war in Ukraine. Um, and uh, we would like to unpack cybersecurity and to explore uh, more uh, to, to explore actually what are the links uh, and connections between cyber, uh, human rights, democracy, and connectivity. Uh, and I will give the floor first to Mr. Weber and uh, ask you to give us maybe more global uh, approach and assessment uh, and to uh, tell us uh, what are the key cyber threats uh, at the moment from a global perspective and which uh, human rights and uh, freedoms are most uh, threatened today by the use of new technologies as you are um, expert on advanced technologies. Thank you, Maya, and thank, that I, thank you that I can be here. Um, and uh, it's great to be uh, here in Belgrade. Um, well, we, in the past, couple of years, we have not only seen a health pandemic, but also a um, surveillance pandemic. Um, and um, we really saw a proliferation of um, surveillance technologies across the world. We have seen private actors going in, into business in um, really providing the tools to governments. Um, some of you uh, might know um, uh, the NSO group, right, which is um, uh, selling um, spyware, which was selling spyware. <laughs> And um, we could really see here that um, there is always, um, in, in these kind of, a key point that I want to get across today is that um, surveillance does not only come um, at the expense of human rights, often, but also at the expense of cybersecurity. Because in order to do, um, con conduct surveillance, you need to um, weaken um, either whether it's encryption, you need to, um, in the case of NSO Group and the Pegasus um, spyware, you had to um, have vulnerabilities in, in people's phones. You had to have vulnerabilities uh, in phones to access uh, WhatsApp of journalists and so on. So you can really see the direct nexus between um, human rights, um, surveillance, and um, cybersecurity as well. But that's not, there's really a, a such a, not only um, the, the number of tools has grown um, um, or the, where it's been deployed, but also um, the different kinds um, of things. So it's not only spyware. Um, another um, key technology um, is um, fish recognition, um, technology that's really been um, proliferating in the last um, couple of years. 
um, and it's um, really a, um, a broad, um, broad um, number of suppliers which are based um, also um, in Europe, in the US, uh, China, Russia, and uh, in this example we can um, see, for instance, the, it was noted often, the Clearview AI. Um, the, it's an American company. Um, and here, the, what it does, it's, it has a large database of, of um, social media profiles. If you have a social media profile, you're probably in the database of Clearview AI, which uh, the American company. And then, um, if um, law enforcement wants to use it, this algorithm um, by, by Clearview AI, they use that database to, for instance, in protests um, um, after um, or during the George Floyd protests, um, the, the Black Matters movement in America, they used it in, in the protests as well to know who was there and um, who participated in those protests. So it's really across the world, also, also in Europe, um, fish recognition is already being used by law, law enforcement to, for their uh, criminal databases. And here the key uh, danger is that um, something called the mission creep. Um, that means that you say that you're going to start using fish recognition, let's say, only um, if you have video footage somewhere and then you have a face and then you'll, uh, you'll, um, you'll run it against the, your database. And then um, you'll start using it also maybe for body cams um, of police um, officers. You might use it in different um, contexts, so it's really, you, you keep on going because it's so powerful, because it's so seductive also um, for law enforcement agencies. Um, that's really um, one, one um, major um, danger of uh, fish recognition. It's also a question that we haven't yet solved and that often police departments haven't said yet what they're going to use it for. Is it for serious crimes? Is it for murders, rapes? Is it maybe for going to use to um, uh, go after homeless people, right, who are, who are somewhere maybe in a subway somewhere, or, um, and so it's really um, not clear today what, what fish recognition is going to be used for, so we really need here um, clear boundaries if it's going to be used. Um, and and maybe, maybe to add, because you mentioned uh, artificial intelligence and the use uh, in the current war, uh, ongoing war in the Ukraine, um, could you tell us uh, maybe what else has changed, what war actually brought in, uh, in these terms, and uh, what can we expect in the future, maybe some future trends as well? Um, well, Clearview AI was used, I think, um, by uh, Ukrainian um, uh, troops also to identify uh, Russian soldiers and then to, to, incite, to um, uh, say, okay, we have these soldiers, you, um, uh, Russian um, families can know who, who was perhaps, um, um, in, who, f who has um, died in Ukraine, right, so that created kind of a demand. Uh, within Russia, but I think the, the war against Ukraine uh, by Russia has uh, really brought or will bring to a halt, I think, um, Russia's um, surveillance exports. There's also um, many Russian companies based in St. Petersburg, Moscow, other cities that have sold advanced surveillance technologies to, um, to monitor internet traffic. Um, so some of you are, might, might be familiar with the SORM, um, surveillance um, system that um, net measures um, network traffic uh, inside Russia and surveils it. And so that equipment was often exported across the world to dozens of countries. And I think now that's really coming to a re review. If you have a, a Russian software company selling um, these tools to your government, I think a lot of governments will now rethink. Um, and so that's going to come under um, increased um, scrutiny. Okay, thank you. Um, countries of the Western Balkans uh, are building their uh, cybersecurity capacities. And what we have seen uh, recently that many countries are under massive uh, cyber attacks. Um, and that's one part of the story. The other part of the story that uh, organizations such as Amnesty International, but also cyber, uh, Citizens Labs actually reported that some governments in the region uh, are using uh, surveillance technologies to surveil uh, citizens or they're buying very sophisticated uh, spy softwares. Um, uh, Mr. Reto, you're coming uh, from Albania and uh, in the news we are like uh, 
reading a lot of uh, news concerning the leakage of the different data and Albania is quite exposed uh, to the cyber attacks. But uh, apart from this, uh, could you tell us maybe what are the most uh, common types of human rights violations uh, in the cyberspace in Albania and uh, which actors uh, and social groups uh, are the most affected uh, in your country? Uh, yes, thank you, Maya. Um, in, uh, in Albania, and also I will touch upon regional trends uh, that we covered uh, in, our, in our research, uh, one of the most prevalent forms of, uh, uh, of violations uh, is uh, online violence, uh, online violence in the form of uh, hate speech or uh, harassment, uh, and, and usually these violence targets uh, groups that are actually already ta uh, targeted in the, in the physical world, let's call it uh, uh, like that, uh, including here women, um, uh, ethnic minorities, Roma and Egyptians, um, um, LGBTI uh, plus persons, um, and also migrants uh, in, some, uh, in some earlier panels today, this was also mentioned. Uh, in context-specific cases, countries of the, the so-called Balkan route uh, have seen a, r a rise of hate speech against migrants at, uh, in certain moments of, uh, of the past uh, few years. Um, uh, so yeah, the trends are very similar with regards to groups and forms of violations, but also there's some context-specific trends, as, uh, as I said. Um, another targeted group uh, are human rights defenders who defend the rights of these uh, groups that I already mentioned. Uh, their uh, personal life is usually attacked to de legitimize their work or their credibility and discourage, uh, discourage action. Um, so yeah, and what's, uh, what's uh, um, a common denominator, uh, let's say, for the region in these cases is uh, uh, the fact that these cases rarely make it through the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, rarely classified as, uh, as uh, criminal offenses, and this is due to several reasons, uh, lack of a proper legal framework, uh, um, lack of proper capacities of institutions, uh, lack of awareness, uh, because these cases are not treated as, as, uh, as importantly, are seen as uh, second-hand problems, let's say, um, so, uh, so they go unpunished and they di discourage reporting this way, so there is uh, under-reporting as well and, and, and lack of trust. Uh, um, so on the other hand, independent institutions are more sensitized and more, more accessible uh, by, the, by the victims, including here ombudspersons or anti-discrimination commissioners, depending how they're they're called uh, in each country, but then again, they lack, uh, they lack uh, technical capacities often, and as we all know, their mandated are, manda mandates are quite, uh, quite limited. Um, another, um, another common violation uh, witnessed uh, in the region uh, regards freedom of, uh, freedom of speech. Uh, we've seen with the pandemic uh, emergency situations uh, in Albania. We had uh, we had an earthquake uh, that uh, that was another emergency situation. We've seen how these have been often used at the expense of uh, of free speech uh, by um, uh, persecuting or arresting of journalists, uh, shutting down uh, online media for uh, spreading panic or for uh, spreading misinformation, and usually these are. Critical Critical, uh, critical voices, um, and uh, and yeah, in these cases, unlike uh, uh, cases of online violence that I mentioned, institutional response seems to be swift. Uh, uh, so there is uh, there is some sort of a double standard in in treating uh, in treating these uh, these different uh, different rights. Uh, media have also faced cyber attacks. Uh, um, when reporting on anti-governmental protests, for instance, we've seen cases, uh, but also on important uh, processes li like elections, uh, their pages have been down for uh, for days. Um, 
Another another trend is uh, is that of uh, the, the so-called uh, censorship through noise. Uh, these uh, uh, paid commentators or uh, automatic accounts that target uh, target journalists or, or uh, media pages uh, aiming to to flood uh, the social media in a strategic way, uh, multiplying pro-governmental content, and uh, and discouraging critical voices uh, as such. Um, and this, as I said, is uh, very, very common in, in the region. Privacy violations, to go, to, to, to go back to the cyber attacks that, that were mentioned uh, earlier, and also massive leakages of personal data have been, uh, have been witnessed uh, by the region. Um, Health-related data were leaked during COVID in Montenegro. Uh, Albania had huge leakages around elections, including voters, personal data, even political uh, preferences, phone numbers, addresses, salaries, license plates, everything out there. Uh, and this even before the cyber attacks. Uh, uh, so, um, so yeah, these have been also in in Serbia. There's been cases of leaking personal data of uh, of uh, political opponents and and using them for for political for political gain. Uh, and uh, yeah, in these cases uh, also there is little uh, little accountability uh, from uh, from authorities, uh, and uh, and uh, little is talked about the potential risks, uh, security risks for citizens, but also uh, space for misuse and political uh, political misuse of the of the leaks. Um, could, could you tell yeah. us, uh, like, because there is a wide range of. Uh, uh, violations you mentioned, mm -hmm. especially not only um, uh, targeting critical infrastructure, but actually different um, social groups. What are the implications of uh, these violations for uh, human rights and democracy? Um, first of all, I would say um, uh, shrink civic space uh, by centering these critical voices, be it journalists or activists, uh, through these violations of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Uh, also deepening uh, inequalities, already existing inequalities and underrepresentation of, uh, of uh, certain social groups and minorities. Um, by spreading uh, disinformation and also even uh, manipulating uh, public opinion, uh, the integrity of important processes can be jeopardized, uh, let's say elections, so that also affects, uh, affects democracy. Um, participation also, uh, or even access to services uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the framework of uh, digitalization of public services, let's say, we see often these processes are pushed forward swiftly without conducting uh, human rights risk assessments uh, beforehand and without uh, having uh, an without evidence-based policy making, basically uh, uh, introducing, in Albania we have 95% uh, of uh, public services uh, digitalized, but there is no data who, who are those groups who don't, cannot access these, uh, these online services uh, due to uh, lack of access to internet, uh, lack of digital literacy, let's say. Uh, so we, we don't know, but we still push this sort of uh, decision making forward and we risk leaving these people out with no access to, to public services, basically. So, yeah, these are some of the implications I can think of, but I'm sure there's plenty of others we cannot imagine. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Turn to help. Um, Mr. Tucker, your wor work focuses on the internet shutdowns and government imposed uh, restrictions on telecommunications. Could you give us, uh, besides like what, um, what was previously mentioned, could you give us more examples about uh, that disruptions of uh, connectivity, uh, especially when it comes um, to different uh, democratic processes such as elections or uh, public gatherings uh, and pro protests and, and what are the actual costs, economic security, social costs of uh, this uh, internet shutdowns and disruption of different kinds of communities? So in our monitoring we've found that internet disruptions have a huge impact on communities. We track them around the world and we've also seen that increasingly these disruptions affect uh, political processes, elections, and uh, they can be caused by a number of reasons, uh, including government-issued orders for, for the shutting of the internet. 
Uh, in research we did with um, a cybersecurity firm, Surfshark, we found that eight out of 10 Africans have been impacted by internet shutdowns in one form or the other. So this is a problem that is particularly prevalent in, uh, in Africa, but it also happens in Europe, it also happens in Latin America, in Asia, around the world. Uh, we've seen that uh, there were some 72 internet shutdowns, so these are targeted internet shutdowns affecting mass populations of people that governments have ordered. And, and this was in the first half of this year, just to give a concept of, of how prevalent this practice is. And um, I think in 2022, this was also the year that we realized there's this huge connection between uh, connectivity and critical infrastructure. So I mean, this was known in, in the research field and in our uh, communities, but uh, particularly with the attacks on, on critical infrastructure, I think in, in Russia, we have seen that these are attacks on human rights. Um, Russia's targeting of s civilian infrastructure, networks in Ukraine, that demonstrates that there is no middle ground, there is no way to perceive these as separate factors. We have to look at the human rights situation and the crit critical infrastructure situation as a whole. This is very much interconnected, and it's also dangerous to kind of set aside human rights as its own space, and it's just something those human rights organizations do. I think it's very much connected with security policy and, and uh, ground governance when it comes to conflict and democracy itself. Yeah. You mentioned the conflict, and we mentioned several times the uh, 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 war in Ukraine. And uh, uh, how, how can can you comment about like big tech companies uh, that are going uh, into the war and getting more and more engaged? But also, uh, we have seen in the video those informal actors such as the anonymous. Uh, can they actually help to overcome these internet shutdowns or in the longer run like private uh, actors, how they influence not only in the, on the course of the war but actually how will they influence uh, uh, human rights and uh, how they will influence uh, how cyber security will look like in, in the future? What are your thoughts on this? So Ukraine has been bombarded by cyber attacks, physically, um, it, by the air, and these attacks have obviously impacted infrastructure, connectivity. It's targeted. The intention is to cut off the public and the people. Uh, now, big tech has responded uh, initially reactively uh, when it comes to actually finding a solution. It, it's a question of finding the right statement, public policy that, that sets that company in a good light. And there have been varied, this has been done to varying um, degrees by different actors. Um, for example, Microsoft at the beginning of this conflict was very involved with countering cyber attacks that Ukraine's government uses in infrastructure. When it comes to actually reconnecting communities, things are a bit more uh, complicated. First is, I think, to actually track and to know that this is happening. Now, when a community is disconnected, when it's hit by um, missile strikes, whether it's in Ukraine or anywhere around the world, um, that region is disconnected. So the people there can't actually self-report what's going on. This is um, an element that is very often forgotten when it comes to human rights documentation, even to journalism, um, to the kind of reporting that governments do, you know, the cables and wires. That, that, um, that let governments know what's going on on the ground. So it's been essential to monitor that connectivity and be the voice of people who have been left offline. And uh, when you look at uh, groups like Anonymous, they've been helping get the word out around these incidents, but they've also been involved in uh, crowdfunded, or sorry, crowdsourced um, counterattacks. So you have, in the cyberspace, where you have communities coming together to launch, to try to knock out um, networks on the other side, so in the Russian space. Now, there's a bit of debate about whether this is a reasonable thing to do, you know, the hackback argument. Is it okay? In, in, in some sense, it has become a bit of a free-for-all because, uh, you know, it's war, and they're, they're, it's about finding a meaningful response and also a way of giving something that people can participate in. So it's not always a great idea to hack back, but that's one of the things that communities have engaged in. If we look more directly at providing connectivity, the, um, 
the US, um, Europe, and many governments have been looking for ways to reconnect parts of the country that are offline. Uh, one technology that has been quite effective is low orbit satellite technology. Um, and of course, uh, Elon Musk's platform, uh, Starlink, has been deployed quite effectively, uh, getting 150,000 people connected. There's also been some controversy around this uh, when you look at some of the unexpected things that have happened in the Twitter sphere, which has also raised questions about how involved companies should be and uh, how much of a dependency there should be on companies when it comes to relying on their infrastructure. But at the moment, that technology is still compelling. It still allows people to communicate, so it's useful. And I think satellite technology will provide a bigger role in, in years to come in terms of providing human rights for communities that are cut off. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to Mr. Weber, uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, what are the threats uh, at the global level, and especially in the, in the next period of time. Uh, could you tell us uh, what policy interventions uh, we need in order to make this uh, space more democratic and uh, with more respect uh, towards the human rights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so something the, the, a great friend of democracy is um, transparency and a lot of these um, surveillance deals, uh, deal, um, these threats to human rights are often shrouded in secrecy. Um, we've had in the last couple of days a lot of um, conversations um, also bilaterally over the Safe City project here in, um, in Belgrade um, and other, other cities. It's difficult to know um, whether the, the features if our features are turned on, which one, which cameras throughout the city use it. And that, I think, really creates a chilling effect in society. Um, people start to be afraid. They don't know, um, you know what, what those capabilities are of those technologies. And so I think and the chilling effect is really the worst because it impacts freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, um, and, and all these things. People don't um, dare anymore um, to do things. So I think we really... Um, I think what's good there is uh, more transparency. I think another thing is um, what was really effective as well is um, public shaming. Um, we've talked earlier about NSO Group. Um, Citizen Lab, um, a Canadian advocacy group, did a lot of reports on a certain company that was uh, engaged in dubious um, sellings um, of, uh, of, of um, selling it to governments that then use it against journalists. And the public shaming really helped, um, and NSO Group has um, stopped our um, offensive um, cyber operations now. So I think that's really helpful. Another um, way is also um, um, strategic litigation. Um, it means that if there is a case um, on facial recognition, um, you can challenge that in court. If a person was um, targeted um, in, a, in a wrong way um, or in an in a, in a abusive way, you could bring that to court, of course, and then make a strategic case out of it, which means that this case has a repercussion on other similar cases where um, fish recognition technologies or safe city te technologies more broadly are used. And then I think that's how we can mitigate already the technologies that are in place. And then there is other technologies that are really, really dangerous, um, such as emotion recognition, which mm -hmm. uh, purports to know whether someone's happy, when, when someone's sad or angry. And that's already being sold also by um, uh, Balkan companies, um, which have gone into that market, not only by the big suppliers around the world, but also by Balkan companies. And the problem with emotion recognition is that it's not scientifically proven. So it's a uh, snake oil. It's because um, sometimes you can be happy and you can be anxious at the same time and it won't um, know it. But so that's, I think, certain technologies we should ban to, to, to kind of um, keep democracy um, to, to um, protect democracy and other technologies we need to um, regulate more strongly, but also ask um, for more transparency. Yeah, maybe one provocative question, but because before the uh, pandemic and the war in Ukraine, uh, there were like a big te tech war between uh, the United States and, uh, uh, and China. And since you were studying uh, geopolitics mm -hmm. of cyberspace, could you tell us, um, Maybe more your uh, view on this, and uh, who will win the war? Sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So a large part of the tech war was also about the major company, about the major Chinese companies that are involved, whether it's Huawei, 
ZTE, but also Hikvision and Dahua. So that's um, kind of companies that supply 5G equipment, but also surveillance te technologies such as um, cameras and so on. And so I think um, it hasn't uh, been proven yet that those the, the U.S. made a national security argument that said, "Hey, um, you know, you you might China might use these technologies to, um, let's say." gather data on, on um, citizens in, in Belgrade or, or, and, and use it to its advantage. But I think the, the bigger threat is that um, uh, Hikvision and Dahua um, cameras, which do make up around 95% or so of the market share in, in most countries, but also in, 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 in Serbia and, and Montenegro and, and other um, regional countries, they are profoundly insecure. So they are really... Um, they, they are cheap, but they have, a, um, let's say, therefore a bad security because that's not uh, the priority um, there. And so I think that's the, the bigger danger that uh, it could be um, the, uh, um, the, the people that, um, or the technology might be uh, targeted by um, cyber criminals, but also by um, nation states that, that are involved in this. So I think that's the, the bigger danger that, um, you know, that's uh, quite um, bad security in this way. And I think um, one could make an argument here to either as a government to ask for higher standards. So there's something called, as, as, a, as a government, you're buying a lot of d these devices. You buy a lot of cameras or you buy a lot of uh, these devices. And then you can make an argument, okay, you need to increase your security. And that's how you increase um, the security of those suppliers. So that would be maybe a way of, um, you know, um, kind of mitigating these kind of um, threats. Yeah, thank you. Um, Serbia, Serbia bought uh, like um, or uh, imported like uh, Chinese surveillance technologies. Uh, and but just to remind the audience mm -hmm. uh, as well that uh, Serbia and Kosovo signed Washington Agreement in 2000. Uh, and 20, uh, and that uh, Serbia was committed uh, not to actually uh, have a 5G here. So this is mm -hmm. still uh, like uh, on hold uh, at, at the moment, but uh, we are like uh, seeing Kovei uh, cameras or smart surveillance cameras mushrooming every time after the, uh, the pro protests in Serbia. Mm. Um, when it comes to the like region and especially uh, Albania, what are your thoughts and uh, recommendations? What can be actually done to protect the uh, citizens or different social groups? The groups you mentioned uh, uh, from uh, online violence, but not only on online violence, from uh, that uh, uh, leaking of uh, personal private information from uh, data stealing and uh, other threats. Um, yeah. Um, first of all, I'd say uh, we uh, we need to um, to build more comprehensive data collection systems since we uh, we are lacking these uh, data collection systems that uh, regarding these uh, violations and and incidents. Um, in, and these uh, systems should include um, information on, on the groups that are targeted and, and uh, information on motives so they can inform, uh, inform decision making and actually provide a clear picture of the, of the gravity of, uh, of violations because this is, uh, this is currently, um, currently lacking, as I said, particularly in the criminal justice uh, system. Um, a legal framework needs to be brought up to, to date and uh, and try to address as much as possible these um, these areas uh, or, or space for for uh, arbitrarity, particularly when uh, certain rights are in conflict. Um, let's say hate speech and freedom of expression. On the other hand, uh, where is the line? And then freedom of expression and misinformation, disinformation, the line between those as well. Um, or addressing strategic uh, lawsuits against public participation, which are also, or the so, no, so known slaps, which are also becoming uh, um, even more uh, um, popular, let's call it, and, and they are not addressed in any of our legal frameworks uh, as such. Um, of course, laws cannot address every situation, uh, but uh, uh, avoid these gaps as much as possible, and then make sure that uh, that law enforcement agencies uh, 
judges, prosecutors are well trained and well, uh, well aware of uh, the need to treat these rights equally both online and, and offline so these can be applied in, in practice. Um, Parliamentary oversight needs to be needs to be strengthened uh, to to ensure more accountability, um, private sector accountability as well, because in in uh, in uh, many cases uh, private companies are subcontractors of of uh, of the government in in delivering certain servants cert, certain services. Sorry or uh, maintaining uh, uh, systems and so on, uh, and accountability of those uh, of those companies is uh, is limited. That needs to that needs to be uh, to be addressed. Um, increased cooperation between uh, cybersecurity institutions uh, and other non-public stakeholders, including civil society and academia, but also independent human rights institutions, because we've seen that the, uh, uh, these uh, institutions treat the, their work as separate cybersecurity institutions on one hand, and independent human rights institutions on the other hand. They, uh, they need to, to work more and better, uh, better together. Um, Address policy and institutional fragmentation as well would be another another uh, recommendation. In many cases, uh, um, responsibilities are spread amongst different institutions, and it, it's difficult to 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 hold uh, to hold um, anyone accountable. And this has been the case with uh, with the leakages again. Um, so yeah, these uh, these would be uh, and yes, human rights risk assessment that I mentioned earlier before introducing any sort of a, a decision making uh, regarding cybersecurity. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would just add that uh, there re at the level of the region, uh, there is a regional agency for service security that is actually currently based in mm -hmm. Montenegro. So in the next period of time, we can also. Uh, perhaps use uh, its capacities to uh, to strengthen government uh, response uh, concerning these uh, these issues you uh, you mentioned. Um, we'll go again to the like uh, internet shutdowns and uh, what are your recommendations, your thoughts, how to keep uh, not only uh, internet on but both how to keep. Uh, uh, public safe online, but also how to keep uh, uh, human rights and uh, democracy online, how to safeguard this? I think with everything that's going on right now, if you look at Iran, for example, with uh, the internet blackouts that have gone hand in hand with state rep repression, uh, this is the kind of thing that can spread rapidly as countries see a model and they implement some part of it. And, um, you know, I think the internet shutdowns have been a tool of repression. Um, there have been dozens of regional blackouts and uh, mobile curfews and filtering. These are three different techniques that authorities use to cut off the internet. Um, in order to resolve an issue like this, first of all, I think international frameworks aren't working. Uh, you look at, you know, there's no such thing as an international rule of law. No uh, other government can really impose its will. And I think this is seen a lot in the telecommunications space. Um, if a country is intent on switching off its own population, it will do that. And this is really alarming. Um, that is something that can change. I think we can start to find ways for, to reconnect people, whether it's um, through satellite, through wireless, through decentralized networks. One of our key recommendations is that internet providers, um, and this is both for cybersecurity and for human rights. So this is a a unified recommendation is to decentralize networks. What we don't want to see is a situation like you've been seeing a lot in the US, for example, where small internet providers are being bought up by bigger um, and bigger providers, and eventually you only have one internet provider left. Because if you have this kind of quasi-monopoly, then that creates a single point of failure. So in, in the censorship um, terminology, that is a, it, it's, it's a gateway, it's a filter net, that can really control uh, people's freedom of expression during a crisis, during an election. Uh, but in a cyber sense, that is also a choke point. It's, it's a single point of failure. So if you get attacked there, then you lose everything. Game over. So decentralization is absolutely key. Um, increasing awareness about this, so monitoring is essential. Obviously, as a monitor, we find that 
uh, the sheer act of tracking these incidents helps prevent them because now this type of incident is watched. You can see if communities have been shut off, if they can't speak up during, during an election or during a protest. And I think my final recommendation would be moving beyond the old terminology of simple freedom of speech or freedom of expression. This is about protecting fundamental human rights. And the internet today has become the basis for all other human rights. So we have to start looking at internet connectivity as a fundamental right. Good, thank you. Um, Mr. Weber, uh, maybe like the, uh, we have like um, a minute or two to uh, maybe conclude this panel before giving the floor to the audience uh, to pose uh, questions. Uh, I would like just um, for you to br maybe briefly comment uh, concerning the title of our uh, like panel and, and the main question because what we have uh, seen from the war on terror until uh, today, it's more militaristic uh, national security approach to cybersecurity um, that not, not necessarily uh, strengthens uh, democracy and human rights. So could be like a different approach to cybersecurity actually uh, strengthen democracy? Could more human-centric uh, approach would actually strengthen democracy rather than having that uh, uh, national security and militaristic uh, approach to cybersecurity, what we are seeing uh, now, especially during the uh, huge cyber warfare? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is a very good and timely question. And I think what we've seen with 9-11 uh, and um, in, in, in 2001 is that a lot of technology from the military has been transferred to the civilian sector, whether that's the police or intelligence agencies. And that was a huge, huge problem because um, technologies that were previously used I don't, in Iraq uh, were then used in, 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 in the US, but also um, within Europe. So there was really kind of a... Uh, they, they, those technologies were being brought here without any discussion, and then once they were here, it was really difficult to, to put them back into um, Pandora's box. And I think something similar happened now during the pandemic. Um, a lot of um, surveillance and um, we, um, weakening of cybersecurity was justified by uh, these uh, states of emergencies. So I think states of emergencies are really, really um, tough and so we need to have even more scrutiny um, during these times. How we can um, put, again, um, I think how we can strengthen our security also as civil society is to make the argument that um, also um, the, the government itself is, is part um, reliant on strong cybersecurity. Um, one example is, um, that I like to cite is end-to-end -end encryption. A lot of governments want to have access, uh, backdoor access to, um, to WhatsApp, to Signal, to uh, iMessage, and so on. And the argument they make, yeah, we can, we can make um, everyone more secure and so on. But that's the wrong argument um, to make, because if you weaken security for uh, police investigations, um, and if they can have access to WhatsApp here, that means also there will be a vulnerability in um, government networks, because um, governments also use uh, WhatsApp and Signal and end-to-end and -end encryption. So I think how we can push back against this is to say, hey, you rely just on the same technology as we do. And I think that's how we can really uh, make um, the, the nexus um, and, and um, strengthen our security by saying, hey, we as humans all rely on, on strong um, cybersecurity. And I think that's a really, really strong argument because until this day, the, end to end, the encryption debate has been going on for 20 or 30 years, or even since really, really for a long time. And governments were just not able to say, hey, we need to weaken encryption because they, they don't have the technical um, argument um, to make. So I think we really need to say that, okay, uh, journalists and, and government um, officials, they all rely on similar t um, technologies. And I think that's really a, a strong argument um, to make also in the public. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Or, okay, we have uh, 11 minutes before the end. I will give the, the floor to you. Is there any question for, from the audience to our speakers? Yeah, one question. Yeah. 
Could you please just introduce yourselves? Hello. Uh, my name is Miloš Mesergia. I have a question for all speakers. Uh, I suppose that everybody remembers the uh, case about Edward Snowden and leakage of the personal data on the Internet. And what is your opinion? Uh, in this moment, is the uh, situation even worse or something uh, is going uh, on the better way regarding these questions? Thank you. Is there anyone else? No. Who would like to start? I can give a quick it, dive in. I suppose Valentin will also want to say something. Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, the Snowden leaks as an incident uh, that involved the breaches of per uh, personal information, I think that's perhaps the long, wrong perspective. Uh, the idea behind those leaks was to try to shed light on government practices that may have uh, violated human rights or may have um, even in broken domestic laws in the US. Now, the, the problem here is, I think, and the reason why that was to some degree problematic was because there was some uh, collateral leakage of um, personal information and particularly sensitive people in the field. So um, while it was a, a, a breach and, and a, a leak situation, it isn't really in the same class or category as a major data breach that impacts the lives of many in, in the general population. So I think it's worth making that distinction when we're looking at this incident versus, say, a data breach because a company didn't secure its server or because it was hacked or, or was even put in a situation uh, where you know, it had to send Bitcoin or something to, to make sure that that data doesn't spread further. Valentin. Yeah, so I would say um, today is worse <laughs> because we also have private companies that have um, these s similar tools to um, provide surveillance on a massive scale. Um, and uh, that, that's really a problem. And uh, those private companies also sell it to many governments and empower them, right? Whether it's uh, democracies or um, swing states or more authoritarian states. We really see an, a strengthening of, of government capabilities whether it's um, police response, police, res police might earlier have needed three minutes or so to, res to come to, to a site, right, to, to respond. Now they need 40 seconds or so because they have a command center in the safe city because they can really come after people. Previously, people had to go through uh, manually through um, facial, uh, through data of, of surveillance cameras. Now they have automated tools. Um, previously, they had, um, yeah, but I think one good thing is with the, with the Snowden, revelation is that it really um, strengthened also global um, security. Previously, you would only have websites with HTTP that would allow really, really easy surveillance. And now you have HTTPS. End-to-end um, -end encryption came uh, about after Snowden. So I think kind of this revealing of things also made things a little better. At the same time, it's much easier today for governments to surveil you because you don't have only anymore your phone. You have your smart device at home. You have your smartwatch. You have your um, other IoT devices. It's really, really a lot of data out there, and so I think that's why things are worse, because there's just so many attack points for journalists, for civil society, and this is uh, a problem that we can see today. Yeah? That is just so many data. If they can't access your phone, they'll have another device that they'll be able to access and find um, information. Thank you. Anyone else? If there is no question, I can uh, c conclude this panel a bit earlier. I'm sure that uh, our panelists gave you enough arguments um, to see how serious uh, the use of technology is for uh, human rights and what needs to be done to uh, protect it, uh, especially online. Um, I would also use the opportunity, what is very important for us to say that this panel uh, was devoted in memoriam to our colleague, Maria Pavlovic, who tragically lost her life recently, last month. Uh, she, she was also part of the cybersecurity network uh, of the Western Balkans. She, she contributed to the, to the study that uh, Maggie presented part of the results of this study uh, that is available also online, and uh, she'll, 
she was loved and she will be missed uh, in our team in the future. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, there will be a 15-minute coffee break uh, outside room.